Amen. I'm going to uh, introduce my wonderful helper this morning, Ian Legier. He's going to help us with something. And I need your help this morning to get started. And uh, we're going to look at that. There's a scripture I want to look at. There's actually a few I want to look at this morning. But just to start off, we're looking at Acts 1 verses, uh, Acts chapter 1 verses 7 to 8. And uh, we read, and this is Jesus speaking um, to the disciples. He told them, you don't get to know the time. Timing is the Father's business. What you'll, get to, what you'll get is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on, you'll be able to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all over Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. There's a lot of uh, mission, um, mission movies out there. You know, like, this is your mission, like the Mission Impossible. Should you accept it? Right? That, that to me is a pretty big mission given to us as the church. This morning I want to talk on the missional church. And, uh, but before we get into that, it's cold out. It's relatively warm today for, for the, the season, but it's still pretty cold out. So we're going to go on a little imaginary journey. We're going to go on a little imaginary journey to the mission field. So this is where I want you guys to interact with me and help me out. Where is a great place to go as a missionary. Anyway, just raise your hand, shout it out. The Christmas Islands. The Christmas Islands? That's a, <laughs> anywhere else? How many people would like to be sitting on maybe a beach in the Dominican Republic this morning? You know, taking a little break from some missionary work. Maybe Africa? Where else? Where else are some good places to go in the world? Sri Lanka? <laughs> Someone say PEI? <laughs> right back there, yes. Where, where would, where's a good place to go in the world? Well, Cool. How about some of the, uh, the, the countries that are considered restricted access nations? Restricted access nations. Tony Smith, I'm sure you know a few. A few restricted ac- access nations. Do you know any of them? Iran, there's a great one. There's a whole bunch. I went on the website and it was astounding. Basically, restricted access nation it includes countries where the government policy or practice prevents Christians, prevents Christians from obtaining Bibles or other Christian literature. It also includes countries where government sanctioned circumstances or anti Christian laws lead to Christians being harassed, imprisoned, killed, deprived of possessions, liberties because of their witness. And there's also hostile area churches where, um, where specific areas of nations or governments consistently attempt to provide protection for Christian population, but Christians are victims of violence because of their witness. We see this all around our world, and it's a real crazy thing. So I want us to go in, in our mind and, and pick one of these countries, any one of the countries, and say, what would we need to do to go and be missionaries in this country? Okay, what are some of the things? Now, this is where I want you guys to really interact what would you do? You get called to be an, a missionary to Iran. What do you start doing tomorrow? Raise your hand. Anybody? Pray. pray. Yeah. So we can write that down. Pray. Learn the language. Learn the language. Yes. Anything else? Have a vocation. Have a vocation. A reason to be there. To understand their culture. Culture. Understanding their culture. Anyone else? Anything else? Customs. Have a love for the people. A love for the people. Maybe the history, learn the history of what's going on there. The political, uh, the political issues. How about the needs that they face? If you're going into a country that's, that's starving to death, there's a door to open up to spread the gospel, amen? How about strategizing? Finding ways to strategize and come up with a way to effectively minister to these countries. Anybody think of anything else? Make connections. Find an organization. Find a reason to be there. Find something to plug into. Make local connections. Find people there who are going to support your cause. Find people there who you can help. Anything else? Does that pretty much cover it? Raise funds. Education. Maybe we need to, to get some education if we're going into a particular, particular field. Place to live, yeah, that might be kind of nice, right? Get the right, get the right uh, injections. 
Get the flu shots, whatever it takes, right? I know that it's extremely difficult for a missionary to go on to the mission field and to get ready for that. Even the process of going into the mission field can be daunting. But God has called us to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let's bow our heads in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, God, I just want to take a moment and thank you for the people who you've called to these countries, to these places in the world, who you've given giftings and, and abilities, God, the least of which is courage, God, just to step out. We're grateful that your message is going around the world. We're grateful for the people who are being challenged to live it out in these areas. Pray that you continue to minister to them, God, and stir something in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I am 100%, 100% not going where you think I am with this message. 100% not going where you may have thought that I am going with this message. Because I do not want to go overseas with this message and talk about going overseas, even though we kind of did. We talked about what the preparation stuff is. I do not want to talk about going into impoverished parts of the world, even though that's super vital and super important. What I want to talk about this morning is the missional church. And before we do that, we need to learn how to step out into our own backyard. We need to learn the culture that we live in. I read a book recently called Comeback Churches by Ed Stetzer. It's a great church. I would encourage everybody to read it. It says how 300, it's actually 324 churches turned around and yours can too. It's a great book. It's a study done on how 324 churches faced their doors closing to their church, faced basically their church being no longer an entity in this world and took some steps and decided to make some changes and have come back Bigger, better, stronger than before. God hasn't called the church to suffer and die and whittle out. He called it to be victorious. He didn't call it to be a pebble in our community that people trip over. He called it to be a tower in our community that people run to. Come back, churches. It's, it's a book that, that itched me right in, the, right in the place that I was, the scratch right in the place I was itchy. You know what I mean? One of those books that you're just like, Oh, it's like a mosquito bite. You know what I mean? You read it and you're just like, that is exactly what I want to be reading right now. This book was intriguing to me because, one, I want to be a part of a comeback church. Not that the doors of evangel ever were close to closing, but I think that we are living such a small scale of what God's called us to do as a church. All these churches had one thing in common. They seen their church as missional. They seen their church as something that is designed to reach into the community. And these principles, these, these actions, uh, praying, the language, the vocation, the culture, learning the customs, love for the people, the history, the politics, the need, strategizing on how to get into the, into the culture, making connections, local connections, raising funds, education, finding a place to implement yourself, and, and even becoming immune to some of the, the diseases of the culture is what God's called us to do in Coal Harbor. When we can start to realize that the, the church has been called to a mission field and primarily here, before we even step foot anywhere, we need to apply these things to our ministry week to week, Sunday to Sunday, day to day. You guys following me? It's a lot of work and we think and we think missions and we think, well, that's for this part and this, this action and this is what, what they are doing, we should be doing. There's a reason why some of the biggest growing churches in our world are in countries that have nothing. Are in countries where the culture is dramatically different than ours. Because somebody said, I'm going to learn the language on how they speak. And if you think that we live in a culture that, has, that, that doesn't have a different language than what we hold in this church, you are dead wrong. We step outside the doors. The secular culture that surrounds us is a different language. They have different priorities. They have different focus. They have different needs than ours.
these comeback churches, every Sunday, every week of the year, these churches began to see what they do and what they do in their communities, in their cities, as a mission field, and they became missional in nature. I want to ask some tough questions this morning. Have we trained ourselves to understand the culture around us, or are we too consumed with our own culture? Do we no longer speak the same language? Have we removed ourselves so much from the things that we're afraid are going to are going to make us bad people or make us sin? Are we so far removed from that that we no longer are effective in our ministry and reaching to people? Because we do church great, Evangel. And like every other church in the city, we do church top notch. For us, we need to start to challenge ourselves to see if we're relevant to the culture around us. And people say, well, the gospel, the good news is relevant no matter what. It's relevant in and out of season. I agree 100%. People don't have a problem with the gospel. They have a problem with how we present the gospel more often than not. They don't have a problem with Jesus died for you. There is somebody who died for you who loves you more than himself. They don't have a problem with that idea. They have a problem with how we present and apply that idea. They don't have a problem with with, there is a savior who wants to make your life better. He wants to solve your problems. He wants to work with you through them. He wants to love you and teach you and, and grow you into a better person. He wants to make you more like himself in perfection. That's not the problem. The problem is how we apply that in the world. I struggle with it just as much as anybody else. This author states that all churches are completely relevant. You can go into each and ask, what year is it in here? And know exactly what era they're trying to be relevant to. What worked yesterday may not work today. And what I think is working today more than likely won't work tomorrow. We need to change the application, but the message never stays the same. The message never changes, the methods need to change. Jesus did this in his ministry. Whenever he went out and he spoke, he spoke in parables. And he talked to people. When he was talking to farmers, what do you think he talked about? Farming. When he's talking to politicians, what do you think he talked about? When he was talking to the rich, what do you think he talked about? When he was talking to the poor and the needy, what do you think he talked about? provision. We need to understand the culture, understand their language and their way of talking. If we're looking to share the gospel with a tribe in Africa, we need to know their language. We need to know their culture. Or in any of the restricted access nations, we need to find a way to get the message through. When walls are put up, when doors and windows are shut and gates are sealed, we need to find a way to get the message of Christ across. There's many ways to do that. It's tough to step outside our comfort zones, but this is what God has called us to do as a church. We understand that is about relaying the message of Christ to our community in a way they understand and can relate to. And if that's the case, if we're able to, to do that, if we're able to, to go out and do that, our church will be beyond capacity. Beyond capacity. And it's not about collecting a huge number of people. It's about seeing a huge number of souls saved. There's a statement that says, The church needs to view itself as Jesus viewed himself. As an agent of God's mission, not the goal of God's mission. God doesn't desire to see a large church, and that's it. God desires to see a church reaching the lost. Not to exist as his completed mission. Well, Evangel, we've reached 250 people. Let's sit back in our seats. We are done. We're done. He sees us as a tool 
to get more effective at reaching the lost and spreading his word. I want to talk this morning about a few of the characteristics of a missional church, what a missional church looks like. First term, if you're taking notes, is incarnational. I love Christmas. How many people love Christmas? How many people, when you came in here and you seen these Christmas trees with the gifts underneath it, got a little bit giddy? How many people started dreaming of what they're getting for Christmas? New socks. Yes. New socks. How many people love new socks? Maybe I'm getting old because it used to be I just want the newest Nerf gun, but now I love new socks. Love me some new socks. They're fantastic. They are fantastic. I get excited when I start thinking about giving, receiving gifts. As I'm shopping, and I seen this huge teddy bear. You know what I mean? And it's not even Christmas yet. And I'm like, I can't help but get that. I'm buying that. It barely fit in the cart and I'm buying it. So, so actually I was, I was carrying it. So I had it on my hip like a giant baby. And I'm like carrying it through, through the store. And every time I step, its head bobbles and its arms are like. And it's this giant teddy bear. And then Tanya sees me pull in to the driveway and get out of the car, and she's like, oh my goodness. He bought a gigantic teddy bear for Gabe, not for me. So I came in and like popped his head up, and Gabe loved him, and was like falling all over him, and hugging him, and everything. But I get excited when I start thinking of the idea of giving and receiving gifts. It's fun. It is fun. Actually, to the point where I have a hard time even waiting till Christmas. Like if I bought Tanya something tomorrow, I'd be like, hey, bought you a gift. She's like, okay, do you want to know what it is? She's like, no. Are you sure? Because I really want to tell you what it is. No, I want a surprise. Well, you can have a surprise today, and then you can put it back in the box and pretend you're surprised again at Christmas time. No. But that's typically what I do. I love gifts. What better time to see what they all represent? than right now. Jesus, the greatest gift of all, the incarnation, gift given from heaven to earth, stepping down to our level, becoming one of us. Missional churches are incarnational by nature. We read in John 1 verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and he saw his glory, glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. A gift full of grace and truth given to us. Philippians 2 verses 1 to 11 says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking for your own interests, but each of you in, to the interest of others. And this, and this is the, the hook right here. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used in his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. We're talking about the missional churches being incarnational. Jesus was the example of being, being incarnational to us, coming down, stepping down to our level, and meeting us where we're at in human likeness. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And that, at that name, Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the God forever. This idea of Jesus becoming, becoming incarnate to us we have the greatest example set before us of all time, Jesus stepping down from comfort, stepping down from on high to walk in our filth. How can we not follow that same example when we minister to the world, to be willing to go out and step into some dirt for people? Growing churches are missional churches. They're incarnational 
There's a quote by a, a missionary by the name of C.T. Studd, and he says, Some wish to live within the sounds of the chapel bell. I prefer to run a rescue mission within a foot of hell, was his statement. Getting outside of the comfort of our church and into where people have real needs and where it's messy and it is gross will change this church, will change this community. Missional churches step out with the gospel. They are not event-driven. Missional churches are not event-driven. These churches, these 324 churches, are not event-driven. They don't sit back and wait for an event to go on to jump on board. They live it every day. The disciples didn't say, well, you know what, Jesus? You get the worship team. We'll cook the food. And uh, we'll get so-and-so to put out some signs. They stepped out. They went out on their own into some of the darkest, scariest places on earth in front of some of the meanest people and proclaimed the gospel. We're going to get into a few minutes what the role of the church really is in preparing disciples. But characteristics of a missional church, incarnational. Stepping down. Another characteristic they describe the church as is indigenous. This means we need to become entrenched in our communities, dig in, and get dirty. The definition of indigenous means originating in a particular culture, region, or country. Inherit a natural or native to this culture. There's, there's a saying, in this world, but not of this world. We are here to be a part of this world, but not to be of this world. Connection without compromise. John, Kel John Keith Faulkner, who was a missionary, stated this. I have but one candle of life to burn, and I would rather burn it out in a land filled with darkness than in a land flooded with light. It's a major wind this week. Major wind this week. Anybody notice that? Or is that only an Eastern passage? I think we got a little bit extra, but there were some pretty good sized winds. And all you people from Newfoundland are like, that was nothing. <laughs> that was nothing. There wasn't even any cars overturned. That was nothing. We had some pretty major wind this week, and uh, I was on Facebook, and uh, <laughs> I looked at, uh, I think it was either Sabrina or Brad Ball's <laughs> Facebook, and their swing set was upside down. It was flipped on its side and all, and all destroyed, and the issue was that that swing set was not entrenched. It had nothing anchoring it down. It wasn't dug deep. There was nothing holding it, rooting it into its surroundings. I'll tell you one thing, whenever the world hits people hard, when life hits people hard, when storms of life hit people hard, they want to see something that is anchored, that they can grab a hold of. Whenever the winds blow and lives seem to get turned upside down, they want to see and know something that they can grab a hold of. Our lives need to be that beacon of hope to this world. And the only way that's going to work is if this church becomes so deeply entrenched in the culture around us that they know that when things happen, evangel is there. They know that, that there is people who believe in a God that can calm the storms. Because the winds of life will come. And we need to be so deeply entrenched upon the rock of our foundation and so deeply entrenched in the culture around us, that they know that we are a stable beacon of hope. He states, Ed Stetzner Saints, the missional church is focused on living, demonstrating, and offering biblical community to a lost and dying world. The focus should always be how can we become more effective and more relevant. 
We heard it, and, we, and I said it before, that evangel needs to be a hospital for the sick, not a museum for the saved. We need to be a place where people turn when they get hit by storms. How do people turn to us if they feel alienated by us? How do people turn to us if they feel they can't even talk to us? How can people trust us to help them through some of the craziest things in their life if they don't even think they can talk to us? This message this morning, guys, is at me too because I need to find ways to get open doors. Scripture in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 22 to 23 says, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. I become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I, I do this all for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. The church needs to become incarnational. It needs to become indigenous. It needs to become intentional. Henry Martin, a missionary to India and Persia, says the spirit of Christ is a spirit of missions. The nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we become. And they go on to talk about the idea that we need to start making missional decisions instead of preferential decisions. Instead of what I want, what do people need? Instead of what I want to hear, what do people need to hear? We need to become intentional in all that we do. We're looking at what the missionary church, missional church looks like. This is it. When these things, when this list of things become our view, my view, your view on how we reach our communities. It's funny that prayer came up as the first because this book actually says that was the biggest turning point for any church of the 324 churches was they got back to prayer. Because that's, that's the starting point where we catch the heart of God. Yes. That's the starting point where we catch the heart of God. Number one reason for churches to turn around and start praying. Seems like an old kind of idea to me, doesn't it? But hey, 324 churches who turned it around and seen growth started with a pretty traditional idea. I have no problems with that. I think that that is a priority that needs to be on all of us. We need to become intentional. John 20, verse 21 says, Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I am sending you. It doesn't necessarily mean to Africa, to India, to China, to Russia. It's not for a select group of people. It's for all people. We have a sender in Jesus, a message in the gospel, and the people who we're sent to, everyone. We need to start learning these things, their language, culture. So where do we start? Very common scripture when we're talking about mission is in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 19. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded to you and surely I'm with you, even to the end of the age. It's important to note who Jesus was talking to. He was talking to people who were prepared and ready. He was talking to people who had experience. He was talking to people who put some of these things in place. Earlier, they asked him, teach me how to pray. They seen Jesus' ministry. They understood the language of the culture they're reaching. They understood the needs around them. Teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded to you. That means that there is something that has already been told to them that they need to go. The key to becoming a missional church 
is for us to start developing disciples. Our task is to create disciples ready and willing to go out and turn our world upside down. Read in the book of Acts that people are like, who are these people? They're turning our world upside down. Who are they? They're turning our world upside down. They are disciples. We are called to be disciples, passionately follow Jesus, and step out into our world. It's an idea that that has really been there from the start, hasn't it? Developing disciples, not fans, not cheerleaders, not actors, disciples. Not programs, not ministries, disciples. Everything is targeted in Jesus' ministry and poured into people to become disciples and to step out. short time ago, I took on a challenge of running a second youth night every week, a discipleship night, a night where we're going to directly pour in to the lives of kids, only kids who want to be there, not kids who their parents forced to go there, not kids who are there because of their friends, only the kids who want to be there and want to learn. We challenge them to document what they're praying for every day, who they're praying for, what they read, and what they listen to. We challenge them. I said it takes me about 60 minutes to put together our discussion talk. I want 60 minutes back from each of you in devotional time and challenge them. We challenge them with video series that we're going through, one of them being dug down deep about learning the foundations of our faith, how to build our faith. And through all of that, it is a slow process to become a disciple of Jesus. It can be a painful process. It can become a time-consuming. It can become a challenging process to become a disciple of Jesus. But if this process worked 2,000 years ago, it can work today. I want to share with you guys the creed or the motto. What's the motto? What's the motto with you? the creed or the motto of our discipleship group. It's not something I wrote. It's something I found. But it shows exactly who God's called us to be, to be effective world changers. It says, I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast and I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I will not look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plods, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, top, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, and my goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity. I will not negotiate at the table of my enemy or ponder at the pool of popularity nor meander in the maze of mediocrity. I will not give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I have prayed up, preached up, stored up, and stayed up for the case of Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he returns, give until I drop, preach all I know, and work until he comes. 
And when he comes to get his own, he'll have no trouble recognizing me. My colors are flying high and they are clear for all to see. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Wow. That hits me because I see that starting to grow in our youth. It's been a challenge to my heart because what, what do I do? Do I do that for popularity? Do I do that for applause? No, you don't do that for applause. Do I do it for recognition? No, I don't do it for recognition. That's too hard, so I'm not gonna do that. That's too hard, so you need to do that. Those are the shifts that God is challenging my heart with. To become a comeback church, to become a missional church, this is what it takes. This is what it takes. It's a quote I want to share with you guys. One final, one final quote. something like this. People aren't willing to change until the cost of not changing is greater than the cost of changing. Well, the challenge today is that for us to not be challenged and change something today, the cost is greater if we don't. It's more painful if we don't. God's called us to be a disciple. And that's a big calling. That's a scary calling. It's going to take us places where we don't really feel comfortable or want to go. But the cost of not going is too great. The cost to stay safe is too great. The cost to stay within the sound of the church bell is too great. If you go away with anything today, I want you to go away with the idea that God has called us all to be missionaries. And this is what it'll take to change our church and our community and our city. I'm foolish enough to believe that we could do it. glad that Jesus chooses fools to use for his cause. Let's stand together this morning.